Hello. I'm sure most of you will already be aware of this book, The Fault in Our Stars, but just in case you're not, it happens to be a very good book written by one John Green. Or, as he's known to his friends, J. Scribble. Now, in the book, John talks about a really cool piece of maths for the sake of setting up a metaphor about life and love. Namely, that some infinities are bigger than others. Unfortunately, while this is a true piece of mathematics, the examples John gives don't quite convey it in what you could traditionally call a correct way. Now, I'm not one to nitpick, but it's just such an interesting piece of maths that I thought I would spend two minutes talking about it. What John says is that although there are an infinite number of numbers between 0 and 1, there are infinitely many more numbers between 0 and 2. That's off the camera. While that seems like a really intuitively obvious thing, I'm here today to tell you why that's not actually true. In the time-honoured tradition, this video comes in four parts. Part 1. How do we count? Let's pretend I have some badly drawn apples, which I do. How do I know how many apples I have? Well, I number them, like so, and then I put them into a list and count the length of that list, like so. Phew, we have three badly drawn apples. The key idea here is that if we have a collection of objects which we want to count, we put them into a one-to-one -one correspondence with a list of whole positive numbers. In this example, we had three apples, so when we listed them, we got a list of length three. One, two, three. This works for any finite collection of objects. Hopefully we can all agree that while this isn't maybe the normal way that we would go about counting a collection of objects, it is what's really going on behind the scenes. This leads to part two, extending counting to infinity. The same intuition as before works if we're trying to count an infinite collection of objects. We call the whole positive numbers the natural numbers or the counting numbers. So if we have an infinite collection of objects, which we can label by positive whole counting numbers and put them in a list, like so, then we say that the collection of objects we have has the same size as that of the counting numbers. So really, when we're counting, we're putting our collection of objects in a one-to-one -one correspondence with either a finite list, as with our three apples, or an infinite list, as with the counting numbers. Infinity apparently descends into my pants. This notion can be generalised even further in the following way. If we have two collections of objects, and we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between them, that means we can match one object here with an object here in a unique way, then we say the two collections of objects have the same size, regardless of if the collections were infinite or finite to begin with. Part 3. Some infinities aren't bigger than others. Say we take the even positive numbers like so. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, so on. Now it seems like we've thrown away some of the counting numbers, so it seems like the collection of positive even numbers should have a smaller size than the collection of all of the positive whole numbers. But, using this notion of a one-to-one -one correspondence, we can see that this isn't actually the case. If we take each counting number and double it, or equivalently take each even number and half it, this gives us our one-to-one -one correspondence between the counting numbers and the even numbers. So, although it looked like we had thrown away half of our numbers, we ended up with a collection which actually had the same size. Now we come to John's example, which for illustrative purposes I've taken to be all of the real numbers between negative 1 and 1, and all of the real numbers between negative 2 and 2. Now, by a real number, I just mean any of the numbers that you're used to dealing with. So think of them like decimals, which may go on forever. So things like 0 0.12, 0 0.5, and say 0 0.77777 repeating forever. Again, looking at these numbers, it looks like the bottom collection has far more numbers than the top collection. But it's not the case. How are we going to show this? Well, we'll set up a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two families of numbers. How are we going to set up this unique correspondence between the two families of numbers? Well, again, we're going to multiply by 2. As you can see, under our 1 to 1 correspondence, negative 1 gets paired with negative 2, 0 gets paired with 0, and 1 gets paired with 2. 
and for any real number x, it gets paired with 2x. So there you have it. Although it looks like there are far more numbers between negative 2 and 2 than there are between negative 1 and 1, those two collections of numbers actually have exactly the same size. Sorry, John. Part 4. Some infinities are bigger than others. Like I said at the beginning of the video though, John did hit upon a really interesting piece of maths, which says that there are in fact different sizes of infinity. What I'm going to prove to you is that the infinite collection of counting numbers, that is the positive whole numbers, is genuinely smaller than the infinite collection of real numbers between 0 and 1. And remember, by a real number I just mean all the numbers that you're used to dealing with. We'll do this by pretending to think that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two collections of numbers. If the two collections did have the same size, we'd be able to list all of the real numbers between 0 and 1 in the following way. So I've written the real numbers as their infinite decimal expansion, and I've just written the first four possible entries in our list. You could pick whichever four you want. I'm aiming to convince you right now that no matter how we list the real numbers between 0 and 1, we'll always miss some. And if we're always going to miss some, we know that the set of real numbers must be bigger than the set of the counting numbers. What we do is, we take the first non-zero number of the first entry, so in this case it's 1, and then we take the second non-zero number in the second row, and we keep doing this down our infinite list. Now I'm going to build a real number between 0 and 1, which disagrees with every number on our list, in at least one decimal place. How do we do this? Well, in the tens column, we've circled a 1. In the hundreds column, we've circled a 1. In the thousandths column, we've circled a 1. And in the next column, we've circled an 8. So, if I define a number which is not 1 in the tens column, not 1 in the hundreds column, and not 1 in the thousandths column, and so on, then the number that I just defined is not going to be equal to any number on my list. But, it is a perfectly good real number. So for instance, I could take the number to be 0 0.229 and so on, because I'll just continue this method indefinitely, ensuring that I end up with a real number which does not belong on my list. That means there are genuinely more real numbers between 0 and 1 than there are counting numbers, so John was right. Some infinities are bigger than others. So there you have it. Hopefully you found that explanation at least somewhat interesting and not too difficult to follow. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Goodbye.